Hello there, my fellow adventurers. I appreciate your patience. This video really took me a long while to create, but I'm stoked to finally put it out there. It's time to take a look at the character classes of Dungeons & Dragons. I love monsters, and I love characters and NPCs just as much, probably even more. While there are many different approaches I could go with, this video will specifically focus on the classes of the 5th edition Player's Handbook. Before I get into the breakdowns, I want to make it clear that all the classes in D&D are good in their own ways. They all have an important role to play. Much like with the monsters, just because one gets a low ranking doesn't mean it's worthless, only that it has some limitations or that it could use some more development. I want to be especially clear that when I talk about a class's attributes, I'm talking about what is actually part of the class itself, just like with my monster reviews, this video is not about a DM or player skill, but rather about what is presented in the books. So let's pull open the tavern door and see who's carousing within, looking for that next great adventure. F tier has a single class, or rather a certain archetype of a class that is painfully generic and almost nobody ever uses. It's a bit ironic that the champion is the lowest position in this ranking. It's as plain as you can possibly get. It has great hit points, weapon and armor proficiencies, a couple bonus ability score or feat gains, and a higher chance to land a critical hit than any other class. But its only real special actions are Second Wind and Action Surge, which it can use uh, once per short rest. Otherwise, it's a long, long road filled with basic attacks over and over and over. The seventh level feature Remarkable Athlete is particularly atrocious. While the Cleric and the Wizard are gaining fourth level spells and the Rogue is gaining evasion, you basically get plus one to like sleight of hand, stealth, and initiative and a few extra feet of long jumping. Possibly the most trifling class feature in the entire game. The style of the champion is essentially that of a blank slate warrior who has power beyond a typical soldiers. The class also lends you nearly nothing in terms of role-playing hooks. Uh, its lore and its legends are vague, though I could see a lot of room to play with them. And its flexibility is quite limited. If you play a champion, is your character going to be terrible? Definitely not. Can you create some ways to make the character more interesting? Absolutely. But the class itself needs major revision. The champion is intended to be the simplest class with mostly static abilities, and I'm not suggesting that approach should just be discarded. It simply needs to be better. In D tier, we again find only a single class. While it does have a bit more going on with it, it still has limitations and drawbacks that hold it down. Similar to the fighter, yet distinctively different, we have the Berserker Barbarian. While the fighter typically represents civilization, the Barbarian represents wilderness. The Berserker is a frothing, rage-fueled warrior who knows no fear and throws caution into the wind, even overextending himself for the sake of pure primal fury. Mechanically, the Berserker has slightly more options at his disposal than the champion, namely Rage, Reckless Attack, Frenzy, and later on, Intimidating Presence and Retaliation. He is all about gaining advantage and extra attacks, even at the cost of his own defenses or even stamina. The wildness of this class will appeal to some, while turn away others who play more cautiously. More than a question of weighing risks really is a matter of how interesting is the class to play. In terms of style, the Berserker stands out and stands tall. But when it comes to mechanics, it's still a very one-sided class that will have you doing the same basic weapon attacks again and again. The Berserker also has generic lore, which is common amongst the purely warrior-type classes. Again, there's nothing inherently wrong with this, but if you're looking for a class that has compelling stories or role-playing hooks built right into it, you'd better move on. I'm glad that the Berserker and the Champion exist. They fill classic roles in the D&D world, but I've never played one, and very rarely do I see someone else play one. As someone who loves Conan and the works of Robert E. Howard, I gotta say that I'm quite happy with how the Barbarian was done in 5e. I just wish the Berserker would have turned out a bit better. 
In C tier, we find four classes which emerge above the limitations and questionable design of the lower tiers. The Battlemaster really focuses on the fighter's heritage as a student of the art of war, training and studying techniques and theories that have been developed over the course of centuries. This is a solid class that balances simplicity and complexity. It has all the baseline fighter stats, which as we know are quite viable, and something of a blank slate build a warrior. And in addition, the Battlemaster gets a number of cool options. Foremost of these are the combat maneuvers. They provide a number of different options for you to customize your fighter. Are you more of a defender, a tactical captain, a skirmisher? The Battlemaster allows you an amount of versatility to fit your style. As well, this archetype comes with proficiency in a set of artisan's tool and an ability called Know Your Enemy, which is used to determine certain information about opponent's capabilities. Functions similar to knowledge skills, and as we all know, knowledge is power. When someone talks about playing a Barbarian in 5th edition, this is usually the archetype they're referring to. Not only are its options more plentiful and varied, but they even allow for other types of abilities beyond straight-up melee bashing. The Totem Warrior gains the Primal Ritual's Beast Sense, Speak with Animals, and Commune with Nature, as well as Totem Spirits that aid in both combat and exploration. While most seem to agree that Bear is the best, I have seen Eagle and Wolf played to great benefit. The Totem Warrior also comes with a bit more flavor than just the plain battle brute, drawing connections to tribal religions and animism, even shamanism. In this area, the Barbarian and the Druid share some common ground, even though it does often have generic role-playing hooks of defend the land and defend the tribe. Moving into upper C tier, we find the Eldritch Knight, a proud member of the long-standing tradition of trying to blend a martial class with arcane magic. This archetype is essentially one-third wizard woven into a fighter, and aside from spellcasting, it gains some really cool features along the way. Weapon bond, war magic, eldritch strike, and arcane charge. I was seriously considering putting the eldritch knight in B tier, maybe I should have, but its fighter core holds it back in terms of role-playing and lore. Of course, you can craft an engaging character story and play your Eldritch Knight as someone who interacts deeply with the NPCs of the fantasy world, but the class itself does you no favors in this regard. It's largely just focused on, well, fighting. The top of C tier is the Hunter. After the Ranger class received a much needed revision, it finally hit its stride, a fantastic balance of interesting, and effective combat mechanics, exploration abilities like none other, and a complement of druid-like spells for additional utility, support, and combat purposes. I've always liked the Ranger class, and 5th edition really does it justice. If only its lore wasn't generic and its role-playing limited, the Ranger got a boost in its mechanics with the update, and more important than this power bump, was the fact the ranger got to really shine and be great in some unique ways, such as natural explorer with advantage on initiative checks, ignoring difficult terrain, and uh, benefits to overland travel, exploration, scouting, survival. Other unique features included are the potent and flavorful primeval awareness, favored enemy, hide in plain sight, vanish, and feral senses. We are now entering the upper tiers, where there will be many entries full of greatness. The mid and low tiers are still cool classes to play, but if you're looking for classes that provide a larger array of options, as well as strong bonds to storytelling built right into them, you are headed for some wonderful entries. The Player's Handbook offers three different monastic traditions for the monk. Open Hand, Four Elements, and Shadow which are all about equal in terms of their attributes in this ranking. Though some people make good arguments that the Four Elements archetype needs some revision, I don't see enough of a difference to separate the Monk into different entries on this ranking. The Monk might not have the brute power and high hit points of the Fighter or Barbarian, 
nor the sheer magic power of the wizard or cleric, but he's in something of a category all his own, an exotic martial artist with high mobility and very unique abilities, such as deflect missiles to repel arrows, slow fall to land unscathed when you drop off ledges, unarmored movement to run quickly and eventually even along vertical surfaces, and many other features that deal with protections and immunities throughout your body and mind. The monk is nimble and evasive, moving about without need for armor, not even for weapons, delivering flurries of strikes and utilizing a number of mystical abilities. Probably the monk's most devastating ability is Stunning Strike. I have seen entire battles swing due to the monk stunning an enemy. The way of the open hand includes techniques to trip, shove, remove enemies' reactions, as well as a self-heal, a sanctuary meditation, and eventually the Quivering Palm Death Strike. The Way of the Shadow offers you ninja-like abilities, including magic like darkness, dark vision, pass without trace, silence, and minor illusion. You learn to step through shadow, which is a fantastic short-range teleportation that allows you to step through darkness and attack with advantage. Cloak of Shadows lets him turn invisible in dim areas, and finally, Opportunity, which provides you additional attacks when enemies are hit by your own allies. The Way of the Four Elements is a tradition that involves channeling your key energy into elemental powers, most of which are spells, such as Clenching Northern Wind that produces Hold Person, a Mountain Defense for Stone Skin, Fist of Thunder for Thunder Wave, or a Mist Stance for Gaseous Form. This path is certainly the most spectacular in its displays, and possibly the most versatile in its capabilities, though as I mentioned, many in the D&D community have criticized this monk archetype, mainly because it burns through its key points too fast. While I do think such criticisms are definitely valid, I want to remind you that my ranking videos are not really about who is the most powerful, but who is the most well-designed. For example, a challenge rating 1 imp is more interesting, flavorful, and beneficial for storytelling than a challenge rating 14 ice devil. So while I do think that the four elements option could use a bit of a revision, I cannot deny its high style and versatility. My only real gripe about the monk is that it also suffers from low role-playing hooks. I swear every monk is either I left my monastery to embark on a personal quest, or I was exiled from my monastery. If it was up to me, the monk class itself would include interaction options like debating and developing philosophy, guiding people to find inner stillness at sacred shrine locations, and working to raise others to a higher state of awareness. A true monk is a very spiritual individual, like a cleric in certain aspects. If you diminish this, you're just playing a glorified athlete or a low-rate anime character. It is worth mentioning that before the Ranger update, the Beastmaster was mechanically weak, and I would have rated it lower. Thankfully, now, not only is it effective, but really enjoyable to play. I've already covered the Ranger quite a bit, and the Beastmaster really is on par with the Hunter, except that it has just a little higher style. The Hunter does have cool and effective style, but the Beastmaster takes things to the next level, adventuring along with his faithful beast as a companion and combat ally. A big part of tabletop roleplaying is about the connections and memories we create with our friends. The Beastmaster expresses that sort of element in a unique way that no other class does. At last we come to a class that has a high roleplaying attribute, the Paladin. This class combines the combat abilities of a fighter with the divine connections of a cleric, which gives it a great mixture of different abilities, along with role-playing hooks built right into the class. The paladin serves a cause, takes up a sacred oath, and it's directly involved with a life purpose that puts him in interaction with both a religious faction and the people he has sworn to protect and lead. Due to the holy righteousness flowing through the paladin, he can heal others with a touch cure diseases and poisons, and smite enemies. The Paladin has an aura of protection that grants a bonus to saving throws, an aura of courage that negates fear, 
and eventually a cleansing touch that removes harmful spell effects. The player's handbook has three different paladin oaths, which are all quite worthwhile in their own respects. The Oath of Devotion is the classic Holy Templar or White Knight. Oath of the Ancients is a paladin of a nature god or a green knight, similar to the Wardens from 4th edition. And Oath of Vengeance is a zealot or dark knight, similar to the Avenger from 4th edition. The Paladin is the first class in this ranking that I feel truly pleased with. That isn't a letdown in some area. I appreciate that some people do like how certain classes are less defined, as they feel it gives them more freedom to create new flavor and purpose. But keep in mind, you can customize or reflavor any class, and it can be even more striking to take a class that has a strong definition, then do something unexpected or different with it. Cranking the style all the way up is the rogue. Why do we love the Rogue so much? Because we love scoundrels. Han Solo, Indiana Jones, Tyrion Lannister, Zorro, James Bond, Batman, Wolverine, Robin Hood, Wesley, Jack Sparrow. The list goes on and on. The Trickster is one of the most powerful archetypes in all of human history. Perhaps the most powerful. Something about finding clever solutions, outwitting the authorities, and making cutting jokes all the while captivates us like nothing else. While you can, of course, make a scoundrel out of any class, the rogue embodies it foremost. The rogue class comes with a plethora of different abilities and options. A few of the biggest hits are skill expertise, which makes the rogue, along with the bard, a master of skills, sneak attack, which deals greatly increased damage on attacks when you have advantage, or while ganging up on an enemy. Cunning action, which is an extraordinary ability that lets you dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. Uncanny dodge, evasion, slippery mind, and elusive keep you avoiding harm, and additional ability score improvements or feats give you further power or customization. The rogue has two archetypes here at the top of B tier, the assassin and the thief. The Assassin has abilities related to disguises, a deadly assassinate ability that deals critical hits against surprise targets, and a death strike at 17th level. The Thief is my favorite of these two, however, with its increased climbing, jumping, and sneaking, and the amazing Use Magic Device ability that lets you use any magic item regardless of restrictions. The capstone feature of taking two turns in the first round of each encounter is pretty sweet as well. As great as these two archetypes are, there is a third one, which I find to be even slightly better. And for that, we must proceed to A tier, my friends. Here we stand amongst the most stylish, the most flavorful, the most interesting and flexible classes out there. While the champion fighter spends his whole life merely making basic attacks and hoping for a natural 19, these classes are wielding thrilling and mystifying options that defy all rules. The Arcane Trickster is not head and shoulders above the Assassin or Thief, but he is a bit more versatile. Take all the fantastic elements of the Rogue and add Arcane Magic to that. Like the Eldritch Knight, the Arcane Trickster is like one-third wizard. While the Eldritch Knight focuses on protection and attack spells, the Arcane Trickster focuses on illusions and mind-affecting enchantments. Along with this are the Arcane Trickster's special Mage Hand abilities, allowing him to pickpocket or disarm traps at a safe distance, and a few levels later distract targets in order to gain advantage. He also gains Magical Ambush, a rare type of ability that causes his enemies to suffer disadvantage on saving throws against his spells when he's hidden. The Capstone Spell Thief ability is so unique, so inspiring, you immediately want to use it the moment that you've read it. Its only limitation is that you'll never steal 5th level and higher spells, but otherwise, there is basically nothing else like it out there. I wanted to put the Warlock a bit higher on this ranking, but after analyzing the class, I think having him in low A tier is actually fairly generous. The Warlock has a style that sits in a wonderful spectrum near the Sorcerer, Wizard, Arcane Trickster, and even Eldritch Knight. With three categories of Patron to choose from in the player's handbook, 
Fiend, Fay, and the Great Old One, you already have a wonderful array of flavors that range from hellish to fairy to Lovecraftian. Combined with the packs of blade, chain, or tome, this class is just bursting with style. It's classic and it's new all at once. And the stories and plots you are involved with by way of your patron adds a wonderful layer to the character. The main criticisms levied at the Warlock are its very limited number of spells known and spell slots, often relegating him to being an eldritch blaster. I share these criticisms, especially when it comes to the measly amount of spells known. I would also very much like to see one or two more options for the Warlock's staple abilities beyond just Eldritch Blast, something such as Control, Trickery, or a Special Familiar. The Warlock is nonetheless quite interesting and a very memorable class. With a solid revision or a couple good house rules, it could rise even higher. One of the most versatile classes in D&D is the Druid. Blast or control enemies from afar, support or heal yourself and your allies, or wild shape into an animal. From a savage melee beast to a sneaky little spider to a soaring eagle. While the druid might not be the absolute best at any one thing, he is very good at almost everything. Well, he is the best when it comes to connections with the wilderness. Or in a 4th edition inspired term, the Druid is the most powerful primal spellcaster. Some even say the Druid is overpowered, with his ability to absorb tons of damage through his wild shape forms, along with summoning hordes of beasts with conjure animals. The two players' handbook Druid archetypes are Circle of the Land and Circle of the Moon. Land Druids gain additional spells related to their homeland environment, and they can also recover some spell slots during a short rest. As such, they are the most flexible in terms of spellcasting. Moon Druids have more potent wild shape options, and therefore are more inclined to physical combat. I do wish the Druid had a bit more in terms of roleplaying and lore. The class often comes off slightly vague in the same way that the Ranger does, with general goals of defending the land and hating unnatural foes like undead and aberrations. You also rarely get a lot of good stories or adventures in D&D, especially in the published adventures that have to do with druids and wilderness locations. I suppose most people tend to have an inclination for more city-centric characters. The wizard is the king of arcane magic, with access to such a wide array of different spells, and with a bigger spell list than any other class. It can do almost everything, except heal. Also, classically the wizard is terrible at fighting in melee, but there are a couple ways to design a wizard that functions pretty well at close range. He definitely does not have healing or curative spells though. That is the only reason why he does not have a maximum score and flexibility, because otherwise he is highly flexible. Between the spell selection and the arcane traditions, a wizard can be a blaster, a controller, a trickster, a protector, a summoner, a necromancer, a support character, or all of the above. 5th edition also handled the wizard's spellcasting in a fantastic way. It's simpler and more flexible than 3.5 edition, while still preserving the classic spellbook feature, and it feels more magical and deep than 4th edition. Wizards also benefit from some of the best lore in the game. The class itself is based around learning, research, and mystical pursuits. Whether taken from published settings, homebrew, or simply the fantasy genre in general, wizards are some of the most interesting and compelling characters who inspire countless stories and legends. The Harry Potter series is an easy reference that illustrates why the wizard appeals to us so much, as we're all so familiar with schooling, academics, and books, and we are all amazed by the idea of learning mysteries and experimenting arcane formula that unlock and manipulate the forces of the world and beyond. The wizard may be the king when it comes to the sheer volume of spells he has access to, but the sorcerer has an edge in terms of style and role-playing. Some might argue this is due to the sorcerer using charisma as his main ability score, and while that certainly is a factor, I say it's more a matter of the class's lore itself. 
Sorcerers have magic innate within them, and their power comes from arcane bloodlines or transformative supernatural experiences. While every wizard's backstory involves him studying spellcraft as though a science, sorcerers have far more unique and personalized stories. That strong potential for storytelling held within the sorcerer is such a high note. The sorcerer itself is an immensely fun class to play, and it certainly is one of my personal favorites from 5th edition. The sorcerer can modify his spells by way of meta magic, which is one of the coolest things I have ever seen in the game. Do you want to twin your spell and cast it on two targets instead of one? How about a subtle spell that does not require you to speak or even gesture at all? Or perhaps a quickened spell that allows you to cast as only a bonus action? Both of the player's handbook sorceress origins are great options. Dragon magic grants a bit more physical toughness, elemental affinity associated with a specific type of dragon, and eventually dragon wings and a terrifying draconic presence. Wild magic is a blast with the potential for a wild magic surge with every spell you cast and the ability to manipulate the forces of chaos and luck. I have personally played three different sorcerers in 5th edition and had players in my games play every single archetype of sorcerer and without fail it is an incredibly fun, potent, and stylish character every time. From the temples, churches, and holy sites throughout the D&D world comes the Cleric, a class that has long held a prestigious rank among the uppermost tiers. In 3.5 edition, the Cleric was considered the most all-around powerful and important class. In 4th edition, he got balanced much better with all the other classes and no longer did a party's survival rely on always having a Cleric. In the spirit of 5th edition, the Cleric has taken some of the best aspects of earlier editions and mixed them along with some new design. Along with the Druid and the Bard, the Cleric is one of the most versatile classes in the game, able to do basically anything and reigning as the best of the best when it comes to healing and curative magic. But, as we all know, clerics have much more going on besides restoring the wounded and afflicted. Depending on the selection of domain, a cleric has a number of different styles and flavors. There are plenty of articles online discussing and debating which domain is the best, but in the end, each one has its strong points and can be used to create an interesting and fun character. Another of the cleric's strongest points are its role-playing and lore attributes. Similar to a paladin, a cleric is a class dedicated to ideals and philosophy, and he lives by the connection he has with his community and all those around him. He follows the tenets of a god or pantheon, and is a living investiture of the divine agendas at work within the world. The depth and potential held within this is immense. Much like the warlock, the cleric is a great class because of the built-in role-playing hooks, which are at once strong enough to follow to wonderful storytelling opportunities, but also flexible enough for you to customize in many different ways. Grinning ear to ear at the top of this ranking is none other than the Bard, which I am personally very happy to say. Following from its major revamp in 4th edition, the Bard class continues to please in many ways being all around quite strong in every attribute. He has mechanics that are so fun, engaging, and diverse, a flavorful style, somewhere close to the rogue and the sorcerer, yet distinct in and of itself. Role playing that is second to none, lore that spans the lengths of many a great ode and epic, lore bard especially is a class based entirely on the pursuit of lore, and versatility that has the bard able to do so many things so well. The fighter has an edge in melee combat, the wizard in arcane magic, the cleric in healing, the rogue in trickery, but the bard succeeds very well in all of these areas, a true jack of all trades, and then some. It seems that wherever the bard is lacking, he can make up for it with his magical secrets, a fantastic class feature that allows the bard to learn spells from any class. Learn Counterspell, Fly, and Fireball from the Wizard's List, or Revivify, Animate Dead, and Spiritual Weapon like a Cleric, Conjure Animals like a Druid. If there ever was a Be Anything, Do Anything class, 
it's the Bard. Between skill expertise, giving your allies inspiration, slinging all kinds of different spells, fighting in combat, and rocking the social and interaction-based scenes, the Bard is an unbeatable class full of character, flexibility, and great fun. So here you have it, my friends, my rankings for the classes of the 5th edition Player's Handbook. It was a big challenge for me to rate all their different attributes, and I spent a really long time going over so many different approaches and aspects. There is a lot going on with the 5th edition classes, yet it never feels overcomplicated. While I do have a few criticisms of the game, it is overall so solid and so fun, and it really captures the spirit of D&D. And best of all, it just flows well. Rarely do you get bogged down in fiddly bits or boring parts, and I personally feel so free to focus on what really matters, actually playing the game. My groups can go for hours and hours because the game is so smooth, it never feels like a drag, it never gets exhausting due to number crunching or overly complex mechanics. I want to give a big thank you to all my supporters on Patreon, in particular Adam Wood, Warser, Dennis Cropper, Abdul Althani, and Vince. Down in the video description, I have a link if you'd like to check out my work. Every month I'm creating things like original monsters, NPCs, maps, and D&D gaming content. And if you can't join at this time, no worries, I have a free newsletter and a Discord server. The links are also down there. As always, thank you for watching. May your adventures be many.